as I'm sure you're all aware, our great speaker who's been here several times, Bobby Ann Cox, who's been fighting the fight for over a year now, right, Bobby? When did it start? Two years now. Time flies. Uh, Bobby's been here several times giving us good news and unfortunately bad news, um, but uh, we're uh, excited to hear what she has uh, on her plate. Uh, so without uh, any delay, let's give a warm folding chairs welcome to Bobby Ann Cox. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, it's great to be back. I think, I think I haven't been here in about a year, but um, it's always great to come to Folding Chairs. I really, I'm so glad I hear that there are a lot of new faces in the audience. So I'm very excited about that because um, this is what we need. We need the numbers to grow. We need the numbers of people waking up to what's going on in our state to become so large that we just overwhelm their system and we take our state back because we indeed are losing it. Um, my name is Bobby Ann Cox. I am an attorney. I've been practicing law here in New York for 25 years. Um, my office is based in Westchester County, so I'm not too far from here. Um, and prior to 2020, my uh, area of focus in law was um, property tax certiorari. And basically, um, I specialized in suing local municipalities, um, towns, cities, villages, counties, um, on behalf of property owners if I felt that their properties were uh, unjustly being valued and therefore being overtaxed. Um, so when March of 2020 came along and um, the New York State governor at the time, Cuomo, told everybody to lock down and stay in their homes and shutter their schools and close their businesses, you know, two weeks to flatten the curve, um, the hair on the back of my neck stood up because I knew, number one, it was not just going to be two weeks because uh, I had been dealing with government for two decades, um, but also I knew that that was completely unconstitutional and he didn't have the power to do that to New Yorkers. Um, and then what really astonished me was that nobody was standing up to, to push back. So everybody just kind of accepted it and said, oh, okay, we're all gonna close our businesses and our schools and stop living our lives and we're just gonna all sit in our houses because the governor told us to. Um, so I started to speak out right away because I said that people, people don't understand what their rights are and people don't understand what the limits on the government is, which is really dangerous. Um, and if you think about it, um, you know, if we have parents in the audience, if we have grandparents in the audience, if we have any students in the audience, uh, you know, they don't really teach the Constitution in schools anymore. And they do that on purpose because they don't want you to know what your rights are. Um, which is really scary because if you don't know what your rights are, then you can't stand up for yourself and you can't push back when the government is overreaching and taking your power and your freedom and your rights away from you. Um, so I'm going to do um, talk. I'm going to talk for about maybe a half an hour or so. I'm just going to get through my slides um, and then we'll do a Q&A so that I can answer some questions. Um, there are always great questions at the end of these presentations. So uh, if we can just go to the next slide. Um, if anybody wants um, more information about the work that I'm doing, any of the lawsuits that I'm working on right now, uh, this is my website information. So you can go to my website, which is um, coxlawyers.com. So it's C-O-X lawyers.com. Um, and you can take a look there Everything that I am talking about tonight, you can get more information about on my website, especially if you go to the media tab. Um, there you'll find a lot of interviews. Um, uh, I do a legal analysis for various uh, news outlets, Epoch Times, um, OAN News, um, sometimes Newsmax. So um, you'll find a lot of those interviews on my media tab and you'll also find a lot of articles either that I've written or that have been written about the lawsuits I'm working on. Um, so you can 
keep that as a, a resource. Um, the first uh, case that I'm gonna talk about tonight uh, is an example, a perfect example, of what's going on in New York and this extreme government overreach. So um, how many in the audience have heard about um, the quarantine camp lawsuit? Okay, so most everybody. Um, so in, uh, let's see, March of 2020 is when this regulation was first issued. So it was first issued under Cuomo and then um, kept getting reissued as an emergency regulation through a year and a half of his finishing of his reign. Um, and then when Hochul rose to her throne, then she continued to reissue the same uh, unconstitutional, highly illegal regulation. So if you go to the next slide, um, this regulation that uh, we sued on is called, was called Isolation and Quarantine Procedures. And it allowed the, the Department of Health, the, either the Commissioner of Health in New York State or anybody that worked in the Department of Health, to pick and choose which New Yorkers they could lock up or lock down. They didn't have to prove you were sick. They didn't have to prove you were exposed to a communicable disease. They didn't have to um, give you notice. So they could have just shown up at your home with a, an order of isolation or quarantine. Um, they could have done this to you, but they also could have done it to your child or your grandchild. There was no age restriction in this regulation. There was no time restriction in the regulation, so they could have issued this lock up or lock down, um, and it could have been for days or weeks or months. Um, they could have locked you in your home. They could have forced you to stay locked down in your home, or they could have removed you from your home with the force of police and put you into a facility of their choosing. So you would have no say. Um, once you were in lockup or lockdown, there was no procedure for you to gain your freedom back. So what I mean by that is when we were having oral arguments in front of the trial court judge almost two years ago now, uh, the judge said to the Attorney General, because the Attorney General is the one who's representing the governor and um, the Department of Health in this lawsuit, uh, the judge said, let's say you take a family and let's say you put them into a facility somewhere, a hospital or whatever, once they're in there, how do they get out? And there was a really pregnant pause and then uh, the attorney general representative said, well, I guess they could hire a lawyer and they could sue us. So that, you don't have to be a lawyer to know that that is extremely unconstitutional. Okay, due process protections are required in all of our laws and all of our regulations. Um, quick difference between the two. A law is something that's passed by our legislature. So our state senators and our state assembly members they make the laws. The governor ultimately signs them, but the legislature makes the laws. Um, a regulation or a rule is made by an agency, and the agencies are not elected. Those are just government bureaucrats, government employees, and they fall under the governor, so they are in the executive branch of the government. So when you have, in this case, what happened was the agency made a rule or a regulation which was really a law. They called it a regulation, but it was not. It was really a law. And uh, we have a test in New York, a legal standard, by which you can measure if something is really a regulation or something is a law. Um, and so we brought this lawsuit. My plaintiffs, um, if you go to the next slide, please. My plaintiffs um, are a group of New York State legislators, Senator George Borrello, uh, Assemblyman Chris Taig, and Congressman Mike Lawler. When we started the lawsuit two years ago, um, Mike Lawler was an assemblyman representing Rockland County. He's now a congressman. Um, so those are my three plaintiffs together with the citizens group called Uniting New York State. And um, we sued based on separation of powers. We said the governor doesn't have this power. Her Department of Health does not have this power. You cannot make this rule. It's really actually a law, and that is the power reserved for the legislature. Um, it also has no due process, 
And also it conflicts with our longstanding quarantine law. We have a quarantine law in New York State. We've had it for 70 years, 7-0, since 1953. And that law is full of due process protections. The first thing that the law says, not the regulation, the law that we've had for 70 years, the first thing it says is before you can even contemplate locking somebody up because they're a public health threat, they first have to have the disease that you're concerned about, right? <laughs> That's pretty logical, isn't it? Um, and then it has a whole litany of, of steps, due process protections that have to be taken before you can even get to the point of possibly issuing an isolation or a quarantine order for, for somebody that you think is a public health threat. Um, and only a judge, according to the law, only a judge can do that, not the Department of Health, not the Commissioner of Health, not some unelected bureaucrat sitting in an agency somewhere. They don't have that power. So this, this rule, this regulation that they issued also conflicted severely with our longstanding law, which we've had since 1953. So agencies can't do that. And this is just a, a, a matter of logic, right? You can't have unelected bureaucrats that are not beholden to the voters making rules that override or conflict with laws. Because if they do, now you've given this tremendous power to these people who were not elected, right? So how can you vote them in and out? You can't vote them in and out because they work for the government and they're just employees. So you can't, ha you can't give them a power that would allow them to override our elected officials who are the ones that are supposed to make the laws. Every two years here in New York State, we can vote in and out our New York State Senators and our New York State Assembly members. So if we don't like the laws that they're making, we can vote them out every two years. And 2024 is one of those years. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. Okay, so in July of 2022, we, we won the case. The court struck down the, uh, this is gonna, I think I got it. Uh, the court struck down the regulation, said it was unconstitutional, and struck it down on a few different levels. Um, it breached separation of powers. Uh, it conflicted with existing New York state law. It had no due process protections. So basically all the arguments we were making, um, the court sided with us and struck down the regulation. Um, so if you go to the next slide, this is a quote that uh, our trial court judge, this was taken from the decision by the trial court judge, involuntary detention is a severe deprivation of individual liberty, far more egregious than other health safety measures, such as requiring mask wearing at certain venues. Involuntary quarantine may have far reaching consequences, consequences such as loss of income or employment and isolation from family. So that's just a, a small excerpt from the 14 page decision that the, the judge ordered or issued in this decision. So that was in July of 2022. Um, we had an election in November of 2022. If you remember, it was the, our most recent gubernatorial election. Uh, Hochul was running for election and Letitia James, our attorney general, was running for re-election. Um, so they didn't appeal this ruling until after the election. So the election passes, they both win. And if you can go to the next slide, um, in 2023, early 2023, they file an appeal. So right then and there, you know that they absolutely, positively want this unconstitutional, totally horrendous regulation back. They want the power to lock you up or lock you down without proof that you're sick for however long they want, wherever they want. And the regulation is pretty heinous. It, it, I didn't even give you all the details. When you have a few minutes, I suggest you go to um, either my website or you can go to unitingnys.com. Um, I do have their flyers here tonight. They're another one of the plaintiffs on this quarantine lawsuit. And um, please take one of the flyers before you leave. Go on their website. You can actually go. They have a page on their website all about the lawsuit, and you can read the judge's decision there. Um, and in the decision, there is a copy of the regulation itself. 
Uh, they could control what you could and couldn't do while you were in isolation or quarantine. I mean, just absolutely horrendous. Nothing of this regulation belongs in the United States of America, that's for sure. So um, Tish James appeals the case. I spent 2023 fighting on appeal. We were in the appellate division court in Rochester, and uh, we had oral arguments in September uh, of last year. 400 people showed up to oral arguments, 400 people. So if you can go to the next slide, we have some pictures from oral arguments. So oral arguments are, uh, it's not a trial, it's when the judges on each side, um, the attorneys on each side come and argue their case before the panel of judges. So in real life, nobody shows up to oral arguments except for the attorneys. <laughs> um, in t even, even on TV, usually you only get a crowd uh, in, in a courtroom when it's a trial. Maybe it's a hot topic or something. But this was just 400 people showing up to hear us argue the case in front of the panel of judges. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, it was it was phenomenal. I've, I've never seen anything like this in my life. Um, it was just, and it wasn't just people from the Rochester area. Um, there were people that came from from Dutchess County, from Putnam County, from New York City, uh, from Long Island. It, it was really, it was an amazing show of we the people, um, and it was very peaceful. They were very quiet. The only noise they made was at the end, they actually gave me a standing ovation, which was pretty phenomenal. <laughs> um, never had that before. So um, that, to me, showed how much people are concerned about their freedom and about their rights and about what the government in New York State is doing right now. Um, you know, 400 is a lot. There probably should have been like 4,000 because it's such a, a crucial topic. Um, but the mainstream media doesn't cover this lawsuit because they don't want anyone to know about it. So it's hard to get the word out sometimes. Um, so in, in uh, November, this past November, the court issued their decision. And what do you think they did? Anyone? Anyone have a guess? Anyone? They reversed and dismissed. So if you can go to the next slide. Uh, I wrote an article, courts pave the way for New York quarantine camps. So what they did was, they didn't want to touch the merits of the case. So not one word in their decision talks about the merits of the case, because I'm right, and the attorney general's wrong. So they couldn't overturn it on the merits. So. They threw it out on standing. They claimed that my plaintiffs didn't have the right to bring the lawsuit. So they threw out the case and they dismissed it and they overturned or they reversed the lower court decision, which means that the quarantine regulation, it's not in effect, but it means that the Department of Health and the governor can reissue that regulation whenever they want. So they have opened the door to a completely totalitarian regulation being reinstated. Um, this, so I'm a fellow at the Brownstone Institute, um, and uh, if you go on brownstone.com uh, and you just put in my name, um, it'll pull up all the articles that I've that I've written for Brownstone um, over the past year year or so that I've been a fellow there, um, but. I have to say that it is so shocking. They're, they're, the fourth appellate division decision is wrong. I'm just gonna leave it at that right now because if you go to the next slide, you'll see um, we filed an appeal. So uh, about a week or so ago, I filed an appeal with the Court of Appeals, which is the highest court in New York State. So the litigation is continuing on. Um, I'm waiting to hear back from the Court of Appeals uh, if they will take the case as an automatic right. I have to write a brief. I just got noticed today. I have to write a brief and submit it to them shortly. But um, they haven't made their final decision yet on hearing the case as an automatic right. So the Court of Appeals is a little bit like the United States Supreme Court where they don't have to hear every case. Um, so 
we need to be saying some prayers that they're going to hear the case. And what I need to do is get them to reverse that horrible decision by the fourth department and um, give my plaintiffs the standing that they deserve as per longstanding case law and, um, and get rid of that regulation forever. I mean, it's just, it's absolutely horrendous. Um, so this is, the quarantine lawsuit is one example, it's a really good example, of the government overreach that's happening, and it's, it's happening in New York State, absolutely, uh, with this governor and, and all those beneath her, um, but it's also happening with our New York State legislature, which is super majority, not just a majority, super majority Democrat controlled. Our state Senate, our state assembly, both have super majority Democrat control, which means they don't even need one Republican vote to get something done, which means they do whatever they want, whenever they want. And if you go to the next slide, um, I filed a lawsuit in October uh, with a colleague of mine against the New York State Legislature for a different breach of the Constitution. This one is uh, the Democrats want to change our New York State Constitution, and so uh, they want to add language, uh, which they call, you know, equal rights, which is a very severe misnomer, um, and they are going to put it on the ballot this November. So uh, my lawsuit is to try to knock that off the ballot because they didn't follow the proper procedure. Shocking, huh? Um, they just did what they wanted to do uh, to put that on the ballot for November instead of following the Constitution and following the process that's clearly laid out in the Constitution on how you amend the Constitution in New York State. So um, this is what happens when you have one party rule. Um, just you know, a little bit of a disclaimer, I am not a Republican. Um, I'm actually a lifelong Democrat, but this is what happens when one party, whether it's Democrat or Republican, doesn't matter, has total control of your government. Right now, the Democrats, supermajority New York State Senate, supermajority New York State Assembly. They control the governor's mansion, right? Hochul's a Democrat, and they control the attorney general's office. She's a Democrat too. And so what you're seeing is one party doing everything. They're making the policies, they're enforcing the policies, they're making the laws, they're enforcing the laws or not enforcing the laws, um, and they're changing the laws so that they are not protecting the citizens and instead they're protecting other people who are not citizens uh, or they're protecting criminals. So it's, it's horrendous what's going on and it would take me probably five hours to explain uh, everything and share everything with you. So I'm just gonna give a little bit of um, a quick synopsis. Um, this flyer that you see up here is an organization um, that's called the Coalition to Protect Kids in New York. And um, they're trying to raise awareness about this amendment that the Democrats are planning to put on the ballot in November to amend our constitution. So um, I do definitely recommend that you check out their website. Um, this is just a, excuse me, a brief overview of um, what that amendment in, if it is on the ballot in November, what it can lead to. We're under this section up here that says know the facts. Um, so, and this flyer, if you'd like to see it afterwards, um, this is also on the Uniting New York State website. So you can look it up there. Um, but here's, an, if you go to the next slide, here's an example of a bill that the Democrat, supermajority Democrat controlled um, New York State legislature is proposing. Now, this has been a bill that has been in, it proposed in past years, in past sessions, but now it has a sister bill. So now both houses in the New York State Legislature have a bill, identical bill, which means it's ripe for passing. Um, this uh, meme that I saw on the internet that people are posting around trying to raise awareness, um, this is the senator up in, um, Northern, North, 
part of New York or up near um, Western New York, uh, Rachel May, and um, it would allow minors, this bill that they're proposing, would allow minors to make all medical decisions behind their parents' backs. If you think that's overstating or exaggerating, it's not, because I've been talking about this bill uh, for a couple of years now. Um, I wrote a Substack article about this bill a couple of years ago. I will write another one uh, in the coming weeks, but um, it is the abolition of parental rights. It is minors of any age being allowed to make their own medical decisions, not only behind the parents' backs, the parents aren't going to know, and the parents still have to pay for it. And if there's no uh, parent involved, then um, we the people pay for it. It's paid for by our tax dollars. Um, and that could be anything. That could be uh, surgeries, that could be uh, you know, hormone blockers, uh, transgender, I, I mean, it could be anything. It's very broad language. Um, if you want to look up these bills, they are public information. You can simply go on the New York State website um, for the Senate and pull up the bill and you can read it right then and there. Um, these are the kinds of things that are happening in our state and they're so dangerous because most people don't know what's going on because the mainstream media isn't covering this. And so you don't know until it's too late. The bill passes, the governor signs it, it becomes a law, and then, and then you're smacked in the face and you're like, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, hang on, what happened to my parental rights? No, no, your parental rights just got legislated out of existence, right? So, which is unconstitutional, but that's a whole nother story. So um, it's really, really important that people stay informed and understand what's going on and then spread the information because the mainstream media isn't gonna do it. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, in addition to my, my legal work um, and being a fellow at the Brownstone Institute, I'm also the spokesperson for an organization called Stop New York Corruption. Um, and Stop New York Corruption is uh, trying to wait, raise awareness about the redistricting that's going on right now in New York State. Um, for the past about two years, um, there have been lawsuits going on in New York over the congressional map that we have, which decides you know, who your representative is in Congress. Um, and it's been quite a... Um, a twisted and uh, turned experience. But um, here in this, in this picture, you'll see we, uh, we did a press conference. Uh, we've been doing press conferences all over New York State, actually, but this one was done in um, Manhattan last month or December. Um, and I had with me um, uh, former Congressman Lee Zeldin, uh, current Congressman um, Mike Lawler, who's also on my quarantine lawsuit. Um, and then you'll see uh, current um, Congresswoman Nicole Meliotakis and a couple other people, um, city council members in New York City. Um, uh, you know, not, again, not a Republican versus Democrat thing. Um, it is about following our Constitution uh, and doing the proper thing. Um, right now, the, the um, IRC, the Independent Redistricting Commission, is redrawing the maps for the 2024 election, um, which, uh, we shouldn't be redrawing maps in the middle of a decade. That's uh, not what our Constitution says. But we're doing it anyway, um, because the Court of Appeals said we should. So um, that redistricting map has to be done by February 28th. So um, we are just really encouraging the IRC, the Independent Redistricting Commission, to readopt the current maps that have never been challenged. Um, the Democrats did not bring a lawsuit um, saying that the current map was gerrymandered or unfair in any way. Uh, they just wanted the IRC to draw the maps. So uh, the, the really simple answer is, well, just readopt the maps we had drawn in 2022 by a special master who's independent um, and is actually not even a New Yorker. The independent special master who drew the maps from 2022 um, is from Pennsylvania. 
And um, we do have to redraw the maps every 10 years in accordance with our census. That's what our constitution does say here in New York State. Um, but we did that. In, in, uh, we had the census in 2020, and then in 2021 into 2022, um, they drew the maps, um, which then started the whole lawsuit process. Um, and the special master stepped in as, as per the court order and drew the, 20, the final 2022 maps, which were used in the 2022 election. Um, and the Democrats didn't like that because too many Republicans won. So now uh, we're back uh, redrawing the maps again. So it's really like, again, this is the kind of stuff that mainstream media doesn't really cover. Um, so I'm not sure how many people know about this. You can go to the next slide, please. Um, if anybody wants more information about the redistricting saga going on uh, with the congressional map, you can go to um, our website, stopnycorruption.com. Uh, and I also have some flyers here tonight for that. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, this really does to me, this describes what's going on in our government today. It is the attitude of catch me if you can. I'm going to do what I want, even if I know that I don't have this power as the governor or as the New York State Legislature or as an agency under the governor. I'm going to do what I want anyway, and you guys can come catch me if you can. Bring a lawsuit, see what the judge says. If we don't like the decision, we'll appeal it anyway. We'll spend a few years in court and hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, and it'll take time and energy and resources. And you know, well, if the judge tells us to stop in the end, well, maybe we'll stop. But if the judge doesn't tell us to stop, well, we're just gonna keep doing this unconstitutional thing that we're not supposed to be doing. So it's this horrible attitude of catch me if you can. And that's not the way the government is supposed to work. The government is supposed to work that the people decide what they want and don't want. You elect your representatives to make the laws that you want and you don't want. And then you're supposed to follow the Constitution once you're in that power position of being in the New York State Legislature or being the governor of New York or, or being in one of the agencies. But that's not what's happening. They're doing what they want. They have their own agenda. They're not listening to the people. And they're certainly not following the Constitution. They're, they're, they're a thousand percent not following the Constitution. So the way to stop this catch me if you can is to elect people who are going to follow the Constitution, who are going to protect your rights. That's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to protect your rights. And they're not doing that. Um, if you go to the next slide, we're almost done here. I think we only have a couple more slides. Um, these are just a couple other bad bills that are in the New York State Legislature right now. Um, this first one is really, really, I mean, this gets my blood burning. Um, it would require comprehensive sexual education instruction in all New York State schools starting in kindergarten. Five-year-old babies will have to learn about sex education because the crazy people in our New York State legislature, particularly the Democrats who are running the show, want them to. So the parents don't get to decide when they teach their children about sex and how they teach their children about sex. No, the government's gonna do that for you. Okay, um, the other one on here, let's see, this is Skoufis uh, in the Senate and Dinowitz in the House. Um, limits exemptions from immunization requirements by local governments and private entities to medical exemptions repeals religious exemptions for certain post-secondary students. Yeah, I mean, they just, you know, I really encourage people to look into who's funding these people's campaigns. See who their special interest donors are. It's supposed to be public information. So take a look. Take a look and see if your beliefs and your opinions are being represented by these people or not. Remember, all these people are up for election in November. Every single New York State Senator and every single New York State Assembly member is up for election in November. 
Um, if you go to the next slide, um, these are just some of the legislators in um, the New York State Senate and Assembly who um, I am working with. Um, those are my, standing next to me in this picture are my three plaintiffs on the quarantine lawsuit. Um, and then some of their colleagues are on the other side. So um, there are good people. I'm not, I'm not trying to paint a really bleak picture here. There are good people in our New York State Legislature. Um, these are some of them in the picture here. And those are the type of people that we need to support and we need to get more of those types of people elected into our New York State Senate and our New York State Assembly. Um, if you go to the next slide, I have two left. Okay, so um, the New York State Senate used to be controlled by the Republicans and the New York State Assembly was controlled by the Democrats and so you had a balance of power, right? The two different parties had to talk to each other to make laws. They had to compromise. They had to listen to what each side wanted and didn't want in order to get anything done. But the past five years or so, the Republicans lost control of the Senate and so now the Democrats, like I said, supermajority control of both houses. So there is no conversation. There is no two sides of the equation, which is very dangerous. I don't care which party has total control. It's very dangerous for the people because when you have total control, you go totally out of control because no one's stopping you. So um, there's a project that Uniting New York State is working on, um, which is to flip 11 seats. So in order to get the New York State Senate to go back into Republican control, they need to flip 11 seats from Democrat to Republican. And if you look up on the screen, these are the results from the last election here in New York State, which was 2022. And you'll see some of these Democrats won their seat in the Senate by very small margins, very small margins. Um, there was one, let's see, John Mannion, District 50. It says he won by 50.1%. He won by 10 votes. So what needs to happen is a, a focus and what New York State, uh, uniting New York State is doing is focusing on these races and trying to help the people that are running against the Democrats in these races to try and flip these seats. Um, I am not here to promote Republicans and say how wonderful the party is or anything. Again, I'm not Republican, but I am here to tell you that one party rule is very, very dangerous. Very dangerous. We have to have a balance of power. Um, so if anybody does want to get involved with any of these races, you don't have to live in these districts to get involved with the races. You know, running for office, people can always use help. So um, definitely, if you, if you want to get involved, um, I encourage you to reach out to unitingnys.com. Um, again, I have some of their flyers here tonight I can hand out. And um, please get involved. At, you know, all campaigns can absolutely use people to help. So volunteers are always always needed. Um, okay, we'll go to the um, next slide. So to end on a positive note, because I always like to instill hope, um, you know, keep this in your mind. What would you attempt to do if you knew you could not fail? It's really, really powerful because I would love to think that people like the people in this room tonight, if each one of you did something like ran for your local school board, ran for your local town council, or ran for your county legislature, or, st or state senate, or assembly. If you did that, and, and you built your base, and, and you won, you're now helping to solve the problem. And, and not everybody wants to run for office, right? So what if you do something else? What if you join a group? that's a civic organization or that's a citizens group um, or, or that is you know, just a, a parent group or something in your area. Um, try and get involved. You know, I know it's a little scary, especially when you don't know people or you don't know everything that's going on, but if we don't take that extra step, if we don't make that extra effort, 
we are going to end up in really big problem with not having the rights that we are entitled to, um, that are supposed to be protected in our constitution. They are being attacked, they are slipping away, and you know, though I am happy and proud to fight for our constitution and for all New Yorkers, I can't do it alone. <laughs> so everybody really needs to get involved. Um, if you just go to the last slide, um, if, if you do nothing else tonight, um, please at least try and help spread the word. Um, I know everybody is typically overworked and overscheduled, so it is hard to volunteer, um, whether it's with an organization or on a campaign, but you could even just help by spreading the word. Um, if you follow me on Twitter, my handle is um, attorney underscore Cox, uh, follow me on Twitter, repost something that I post, um, or follow me on Substack. I also write a Substack, um, and I have cards tonight, um, happy to hand out, that um, have my Substack information on there. It's all free information. Um, you can go to substack.com, just type in my name, and I write an article once a week, and if you're signed up on my Substack, it automatically goes into your inbox. Um, and I typically will talk about, it's always about a legal issue, but typically it will be constitutionally based, whether it's New York State Constitution or it's federal constitution. Um, so it's really important to stay informed, but to get other people involved too, and get other people the information that you've now obtained. If your appeal doesn't fly, what's plan B? <laughs> so, um, if this application to the Court of Appeals um, is denied as, as a right of appeal, um, I will then make a motion to the court and ask them to reconsider. Uh, if they do not, then what would happen is the, the regulation would stay dead, it no longer exists right now, but the door would be open for the governor and the Department of Health to reissue. If you are able to plead your case and they uh, decide to go against you the way the appellate court did, then what's plan B? What, what, what's left? I mean, we, do we go to the United States Constitution? Do they care what goes on in New York? Um, it's unclear if we could do, if there's a path to SCOTUS or not. So I'm hoping it doesn't get that far. <laughs> so um, everybody say your prayers every night and include me in there. Um, but yeah, so I'm not sure if we have a direct path. We have a path to anything after this. Well, it, it's, it's so not, so that's a good question. Not everything can be won in a court of law. Sometimes things have to be won politically. And that's why in all my speeches, I also encourage people to get involved on a political level, whether that just means going to vote or bringing 10 friends with you to vote or doing a voter registration drive. You know, we have to also fight this politically. Um, calling your state senator, calling your state assembly member, sending them an email, telling them you don't want this regulation reissued. Let them hear your voice. If they don't hear from you, they don't know what you want or what you don't want. And if they hear from enough of you, they'll start to listen, right? So we do have to be vocal. We have to have our voices heard. I have two questions. One, you, early on you said that there were tests to determine whether something is a regulation versus a law. I was just wondering if you could expand on that. Okay, yeah, there, it, so um, actually if you read the judge's decision that's on the website for Uniting NYS, if you click on the judge's decision, um, that four-prong test is laid out in the judge's decision so you can get all the details Great. of, yeah, of how they measure that. And the second question, and I think the answer is just yes, but Letitia James was the AG that the first judge asked what would be the process that a family would get out of a quarantine. Facility. Well, her office was. She personally, she doesn't uh, argue cases. Office, yeah, she doesn't argue they cases. She's. No answer other than I guess they should need to sue. Yeah. Okay. You can hire a lawyer and you can sue to try and get your freedom back. That was their response. The appellate division decision, I assume, was political, but I'm wondering is there anyone else that you've analyzed that would have more standing that would, would, would withstand that challenge in the court? No. 
So they have the best standing. Yeah, there is nobody. Uh, you could never get standing. Uh, you know, the attorney general argued that um, uh, the right plaintiff is somebody who's been locked up by uh, Rule 2.13. Um, but that's not true because, first of all, if, if somebody did get locked up pursuant to 2.13, by the time they got a lawyer and got a, a lawsuit filed and got in front of a judge, they'd be out of quarantine. So then the next step would be the attorney general would say, oh, dismiss it for mootness. It's moot now because they're out. I know, they've been out for four weeks already. So you know, how can you have a lawsuit when the person's already free? So it would never actually get adjudicated. Right? So my plaintiffs 1,000% have standing. And the trial court judge was so sure that we had standing, he didn't even spend one word in his decision about standing, because it's so obvious they have standing. So um, they have standing, um, and that's why we're appealing to the Court of Appeals. And you know, obviously, we're hoping the Court of Appeals will hear the case and agree with us, because um, we have the case law on our side. We have the Constitution on our side, and uh, certainly the uh, the interest of the people of New York are on our side. Are you asking people to write to the Court of Appeals? No, no. I'm asking people to talk to their New York State senators, their New York State Assembly members, and ask them um, where they stand on this position, and ask them to publicly denounce it. It doesn't, again, it doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or Republican, you should 100% be against a regulation that an agency writes, overrules a law. I mean, what's the point in having the New York State Legislature if you can have agency bureaucrats writing rules that conflict with our laws? It's anarchy, it's literally, right? So reach out to your state representatives. Yeah. Hi, Bobby. These detention centers or camps, are they established within the state already in locations? So the regulation um, allowed the uh, Department of Health to use any facility, any building, as a quarantine facility. So the regulation actually says they could take anything, a multifamily house, you know, a hotel, a motel, a school, a prison, because you know, Hochul's letting all the criminals out of prison because that's, you know, it's racist to have prisons. So it's, it's unbelievable. And the regulation also said that um, if, they, if they take, let's say you have a multifamily home or something, or you own an apartment building or something, and they take it to turn it into a facility, uh, for quarantines that they could prohibit you from going on your own property. You know, it's, it's, you, you have to read the regulation. I mean, people think I, that I exaggerate. It is all in black and white in the regulation. My question is, do you have any insight into what's really behind all this? Why are the Democrats so squirrely about it? Why is the major media likewise ignoring it? What is the motivation for the AG and the governor to, to create this? Yeah, I, I don't know um, where it's coming from. They have been fighting me tooth and nail for two years. I started this lawsuit um, two years ago. So, and they've been fighting hard against it. You know, they removed it to federal court. I had to fight to get from federal court back into state court. Uh, they opposed the amicus brief that was written in 2022 by a group of New York State Assembly members, not my plaintiffs, but another group of New York State legislators wrote an amicus brief to um, support my case. The AG opposed it. We had to have motion practice back and forth, fighting with them to ju just even let the judge read the amicus brief. Um, it's just been one thing after the next. And you know they're doing it to stall. They're doing it to burn through my resources. I've been handling this case pro bono for two years. Um, I'm handling the ERA lawsuit pro bono. Um, so they, you know, it's David versus Goliath. Is is 100% what's what's going on. So where it's coming from, I don't know. But they're doing um, a great job to try to uh, to overpower and win. But you know what? Um, you know, David won, um, and David won at the trial court level, 
So um, we're gonna continue fighting and uh, any support you guys can give is great. Spreading the word is key. Um, getting involved, it, it, whether it's in an organization, a group, um, get involved with you know folding chairs. Um, uh, get involved with someone's campaign that you believe in. Um, you don't have time, make a donation. If you can make a donation, it, it's great. I have a donate button on my website, um, coxlawyers.com. So please stay involved, be engaged, and um, vote. Vote, vote, get everybody you know to vote. Everybody you meet, ask them, are you registered to vote? No? Let me help you register to vote. For those judges that were um, struck down your position, um, your court ruling, how many of those are up for election? And how do you debench judges like that? Yeah, so unfortunately, Oh. In New York State, um, only our trial court judges are elected. So our first level of judge, those are elected. Our appellate court judges and then our court of appeals judges are all appointed by the governors. <laughs> so you don't really realize when you are electing a governor, you are not just electing a governor you are electing the person that is in charge of enforcing our laws and in charge of appointing our appellate judges. So it's really, really important. And then in New York State, the way our constitution is written is our, um, our New York State Senate approves any judicial appointees. So the governor can appoint judges, but then the Senate has to approve those judges um, so another reason to really want the Senate to go back into Republican control because then, again, you have to have the balance, right? If you have a Democrat appointing all these judges and then you have a Republican Senate appointing them, there has to be a compromise. Um, but when you have one party ruling everything, this, this is the mess that we're in. Th this everything that you are annoyed about in your life, the freedoms that you're losing, the freedoms that your children are losing, um, the, the state of our society, the crime, uh, the inflation, the unaffordability of this state, the massive number of illegal migrants in this state that we are all paying. They just passed, for the 2024 budget that they passed last year in 2023, two billion of your dollars for the, that's what they want to put in the new budget, because now they're starting new budget hearings for 2024. They want $2 billion, with a B, of your tax dollars to go to fund the illegals, the illegals that they are bringing into the state on purpose. We are not just a sanctuary city in New York City. We are a sanctuary state in New York State. Something that Governor Hochul can change by signing a, a piece of paper, but she won't. What does that tell you? Oh, and by the way, uh, I was on uh, an interview, I think it was Dr. Drew the other night, and um, this came up. In 2021, the New York City Council, now this is New York City, it's not New York State, but this is a perfect example. The New York City Council passed an ordinance, a, a local law, which said that um, non-citizens could vote in their elections. It was challenged, it was struck down, by the child court judge. He said, this is unconstitutional. Here are all the provisions in the Constitution, why this is unconstitutional. Do you know that Mayor Adams is appealing that decision? What about laws? Are they cooking up laws to force homeowners to take in migrants? Um, to my knowledge, I don't know of any in New York State right now. But the way that it works is that they usually start with suggestions and then they get the psyche right. to norm normalize that idea. Mm -hmm. And then when it doesn't sound so crazy, then they start with, oh, well, you know, I don't know, maybe they'll offer paying. Oh, we'll pay you X number of dollars a month to, uh, you know, house this many or whatever, you know, and, and then they slowly, 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 and then eventually, yeah, I, I would not be shocked if eventually there's a law that says, well, you, everybody's gotta do their part, so, you know, kick in six months here, guys. You have to listen to what they say. 
but you have to actually listen to what they say. So don't listen to what they say or read what they say and then be like, oh, oh, so, okay, maybe they are on our side. No. So a perfect example, Biden wants more, or maybe it was the, the Democrats, want, they want to put more border patrol agents at the southern border. Don't you want that? Why would you not want more at the southern border? And it's like, well, because what you're telling the border patrol agents to do at the southern border is usher them in, take their luggage, pack it into their SUVs, and ship them off to wherever they're going. So they want more border patrol agents. They're not saying they're going to start enforcing the laws. They just want more because then they can process more people. There are ports of entry. We have many ports of entry. These people are not going to the ports of entry. They're going around the ports of entry. And why would you do that unless somebody was directing you to do that? If you're really seeking asylum, you will go to a port of entry and you will hand yourself in and say, I need your help, please help me. But that's not what they're doing. And in 2023 alone, this was in my, my substack from two weeks ago, in 2023 alone, 169 terrorists were caught trying to come through our southern border. That's, the, that's only 2023. That's caught. And that's caught. That does not count how many were not caught. And the number is about, I believe it's between eight and nine million illegal immigrants that Biden has let through in the last three years. Eight or nine million. To, to give you a reference, to give perspective, and then this is the last thing I'll say about that situation. Um, when Biden was vice president and Mayorkas was the deputy, because now he runs the show with the Border Patrol, but when he was the deputy at the time, um, under Obama's administration, they considered 1,000 attempted illegal entries to be a crisis. 1,000 attempted illegal entries at the southern border. Do you know what the number is? You know, you know what it was in December, how we closed out 2023? 373,000. 9,700 crossings a day. Not attempted crossings a day. And if you want information about the border and what's going on, you can actually, I suggest following the National Border Patrol Council. It's, it's the union for border patrol agents in our country. Um, and if you go like on Twitter or go on social media or whatever and follow the National Border Patrol Council, they are speaking out freely about how Biden is tying their hands, not allowing them to enforce our laws. And just because an executive, whether it's Biden or it's Hochul or whoever, just because they don't enforce our laws doesn't mean those laws go away. We still have an, um, uh, immigration laws, they're just being violated daily by the Biden administration on purpose. So it's a really big problem. It's a really big problem. But we need to kind of focus right now locally because locally is where you're going to really make strides. Um, and it's also not as overwhelming. I think people think of like, you know, the federal government and they just get overwhelmed and then they throw their hands in the air and say, we can't do anything about it. But we can, and we have to. There's an ancient Greek philosopher um, whose name was Heraclides. And he said something that was so striking to me. It, he said, the truth is often eluded because it's so unbelievable. So you hear something and you think that cannot be true and you just fluff it off and you keep going. Well, it is true. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you that it's not going away unless we the people all get involved and do something. Um, when it gets overwhelming and, and you feel like you need to shut your computer off or you know turn off the television and go hide in a corner somewhere, <laughs> um, don't get overwhelmed. It's easy to get overwhelmed with all the negativity um, and it's easy to then just throw in the towel. 
but instead of getting overwhelmed and throwing in the towel, I, I would really like everybody to just take a step back and just close your eyes and say to yourself, God put us in this moment in history for a reason. So let's all please get involved and do something. Bobby Ann, thank you very much for all you do, for making the time for us, for educating us. Let's draw a line and get Bobby Ann. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>